Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Hello, I'm Pastor Gervais Charmley. Welcome back to Bethel Evangelical Free Church Hanley on YouTube. This year, the year 2021, is 500 years since Martin Luther the Protestant reformer, the, the great reformer as he is known, appeared before the Diet of the Holy Roman Empire in the German imperial city of Worms. He was there to give an account for what he had said. He was there really to respond to the summons of the emperor. And in this year, as we once again think about Martin Luther and what he has done, what he did, I thought it helpful, a good idea, but perhaps to talk about certain books about Martin Luther. Now, to remind ourselves, what did Luther say at Worms? Well, this is a, an, older, an older work, 1970s, The Trial of Luther, and it contains, I quote from page 161 from The Trial of Martin Luther. Since then, your serene majesty and your lordships require a simple answer. I will give you one without horns and without teeth in these words. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures, or by evident reason, for I put my faith neither in Pope nor councils alone since it's established, that they have erred again and again and contradicted one another. I am bound by the scriptural evidence adduced by me, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot, I will not recant anything, for it is neither safe nor right to act against one's conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. So Martin Luther bore witness before that august assembly of the, the great and the good of the Holy Roman Empire. So he bore witness before the great emperor Charles V. He bore witness that his conscience was captive to the word of God. Now, when we look at Martin Luther, the the classic biography, and my copy is not a modern edition, is this one. It's uh, Roland H. H. Bainton, Here I Stand, A Life of Martin Luther. Now, this is quite an old copy. I think this is from the 1960s or even from the 1950s, this copy. It was originally published way back in 1950. And... It's still in print. It still sells. Bainton was not a conservative evangelical by any means. Bainton wrote a biography of Servetus, the man who was famously burned at Geneva, in which he demonstrates a very definite sympathy with Servetus. But he has that great characteristic that is necessary for any good biographer which is that he has a sympathy for the subject, even when he doesn't agree with them. And it's absolutely important, absolutely vital in a biography. If I were asked, what is the, the one thing that absolutely kills a biography? It's when it's written by somebody who has absolutely no sympathy at all with the subject. Well, Bainton has a definite sympathy with, with Luther, although a disagreement on various issues. And this is still one of the, the classics. It's as I say, very old. It's over a half a century old now, getting on, in fact, yes, um, getting on now for three quarters of a century old, and nevertheless it's still in print, it's still, we it's still well worth reading. So that's Bainton. A couple of more recent books. This is, of all the modern biographies of Martin Luther, I would say that this is the the best. As you can see, it's quite a quite a fat book. It's a an academic book with pages and pages of footnotes, but it's Lyndall Roper, Martin Luther, Renegade and Prophet. Roper is Australian. She's the daughter of a Presbyterian pastor. So she has this Reformation heritage. But what's most important with Roper is that she knows how to write, that she's done the research and it's all in here. This is somebody who is very, very careful to tell 
the story of Martin Luther accurately. Because it's all very well to applaud Luther and note what a, a wonderful man he was and what great things he did. But what we need most of all, again from a biographer, is the facts. We need someone who's actually studied it and isn't just passing on legends. Because Martin Luther, it's been said that there'd be more biographies written of Luther than anybody else other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And Luther has also attracted a lot of legends and myths around him. And indeed some of the things that we're now pretty sure aren't myths have been dismissed as myths in the past. So something that involves modern up-to-date scholarship. From Luther's birth, his background, his father was a, a miner who by his own hard work really became a notable man entered the, the rising middle classes, became involved in the, the local town council where he lived. And of course we have with Luther this man who is tormented by the, the religious visions of his day. He was a, an immensely serious man. You know, we have that wonderful picture on the front of that Martin Luther the monk. That's the early Luther now. Of course, Luther develops and changes as human beings do. And this is also it's very well illustrated. We have there Martin Luther's parents, painted, of course, in old age. Uh, Wittenberg, the great city that's associated with him. It's, it's well written, it's very readable, and don't let the size put you off. Another, another modern volume, Martin Luther, Catholic Dissident. This is a, a more popular level, although as you can see popular is perhaps a, a, rel a relative phrase, but it's many, many fewer notes. It's written on a more popular level. The author, Peter Stanford, is a Roman Catholic. Now you say, Roman Catholic biography of Luther? Yes, but it's not a Roman Catholic biography of Luther, it's a biography of Luther by a Roman Catholic. There is a difference. And one of the things that Martin Luther himself, with all the so-called magisterial reformers, the Martin Luther, Calvin, the, the people we think of as the mainstream of the Reformation, all of them regarded themselves as Catholics. Martin Luther felt the problem was that the church had departed from Catholic, that is universal truth, and had to be brought back. They were reformers, they were not new church founders. Now, events happened the way they did and so it happens that actually the reformers did end up with this church split. And when it comes to a church split, it's very important that, to remember that a church split doesn't mean that you have, here's this, this church and then this group goes off. Rather, what a church split tends to mean is that here's this church and then two groups go off. And one of them may remain in possession of the buildings and the other one doesn't. And we find this in the Reformation era. The Reformation is really the, the medieval Catholic church with all of its internal issues and stresses and strains as it lurches into the 16th century. And Martin Luther challenges the the papacy, in, because he's great challenges o initially over this business of indulgences. Now, indulgences are it's all. Let's put that one back. Indulgences are all bound up with this idea of purgatory, and that the Pope has this power to remit. And it's, it's a very complex, actually, theology behind it. And that's one of the things that a good Luther biography will go into is, okay, what's an indulgence? An indulgence isn't a permission to commit sin. Rather, the idea was, and it goes back to the, to the, through this whole doctrine of penance, that sin, when you commit a sin, there are two aspects to it. And one of these aspects is temporal punishment. And if you have an incomplete well, not contrition for sin, but attrition for sin. So contrition is I am thoroughly contrite, I bewail my sin, I repent in dust and ashes. Attrition is I'm scared I'm going to hell, oh God, please, please do something. Attrition is incomplete repentance in that sense. And the theology of the Catholic Church, the medieval Catholic Church, develops 
And partly it's to do with this, something that comes in a, quite early in the church, is the idea of doing something to demonstrate that you are truly penitent. Bring forth fruits, meet for repentance. And the idea is that if you are truly penitent, if you have swindled your neighbour and he's dead and he's still alive, then you restore to him what you've given. Well, if you swindle your neighbour and he's dead, he's got no heirs, what do you do? Well, you might be told to give the money to the poor. If you're a rich man, you've committed a, a terrible sin, then you might be told when you confess it, look, to show that you're penitent, then give to the poor or give some money to the rebuilding of the church. And this, which initially is about showing that you're penitent, becomes over time seen as a, a temporal punishment of sin. So sin has eternal punishment in hell, but there's also a temporal punishment. Now what happened? Now what then is? Well, then you, you work it off, as it were. But what happens when you die and you've still got these temporal punishments piled up? Well, what eventually comes to be seen is this idea of purgatory, that you, there's somewhere that you have to go to work them off, as it were. And indulgences are effectively time off purgatory. They are getting someone, re remitting the temporal punishments due to sin. Initially, again, this was all in this life, but you, you get this idea that it carries on into the next life. Now, this became open to appalling abuses. And, of course, the notorious one, we've heard the story, the indulgent seller comes to town and there's the jingle as soon as the coin and the your coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Now, this wasn't official Roman Catholic theology, but this was what Tetzel, who was a complete and total rogue, he was a swindler, was doing. And the, the Roman Catholic Church, the medieval Catholic Church, had become, and certainly the papal curia back in Rome, had become dependent on this sort of thing to pay for all kinds of things, and particularly the rebuilding of St Peter's Basilica in Rome. And it became a scandal, and Martin Luther protests, but Luther goes beyond simply protesting, no, this is an abuse of the Church's teaching, which it was. Um, you know, Modern-day Roman Catholics would tell you, look, what Tetzel was doing was an abuse of the Church's teaching. In fact, the Council of Trent rolls back a lot of these things and says, no, actually, we've got to put our house in order. But... At the time of Martin Luther, Luther's basically just told, shut up. But Luther goes deeper and says, well, is the theology behind this right? And so this is what you'll find in a good Luther biography like these ones. You'll find dealing with this question. Now, one of the things that Luther is well known for is his development of uh, printing. And this is an excellent book. This is uh, Andrew Pettigree, Brand Luther. How an, 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 an unheralded monk turned his small town into a centre of publishing, made himself the most famous man in Europe, and started the Protestant Reformation. This is all about Martin Luther and printing. It starts back with the, the printing of the indulgences. And this is a certain irony here that the technology that Luther then uses to spread his teaching, which is printing with movable type, what we think of as what leads to modern printing is, of course, movable types obsolete now. It's all computers. But the ancestor of modern printing that Luther used to spread his material is used to print the very indulgences that he is protesting against. And this shows the development of Luther's writings, of Luther's printing. And again, it's a, it's a very scholarly work. It's very readable, though, and, uh, of course, being a book about printing, Renaissance printing, it's nicely illustrated, which I always like with a book like this. It gives an idea, OK, what did the printing look like? So that's Brand Luther. Finally, this is a rather different book. This is uh, an edited volume, edited by R.C. Sproul and Stephen J. Nichols. One of the last things that R.C. Sproul worked on before his death, The Legacy of Luther. This was published in, where are we, 
2016 and it's a series of essays on Martin Luther, why Luther's important, what Luther taught, outline Luther's life and again extremely helpful some of the names here Stephen J Nichols, Stephen J Lawson, David Calhoun, Joel Beakey, Michael Horton, Sinclair Ferguson, Robert Godfrey, Jean Edward Veith, Derek Thomas and of course R.C. Sproul and again very readable published by Reformation Trust and the legacy of Luther. So those would be my top, top four, five, my top five Luther books. Those are the books that I would recommend on Martin Luther. They, they range, of course, from the more scholarly to the, the more popular, but all of them are well written, well researched, and most importantly, well worth reading. No doubt there will be some more material on Luther later this year. The 18th of April is the exact 500 years anniversary of uh, the fi exact 500th anniversary of Luther's speech at the Diet of Worms, and we remember him because he took a stand on the Word of God. The great tragedy of Luther. In many ways, the great tragedy is that his critics, those who challenged him, didn't respond to his challenge with the Bible. They didn't respond by saying, Brother Martin, this is why you're wrong. They responded instead by saying, oh, just shut up and listen to the Pope. When Martin Luther speaks about his conscience, my conscience is bound by the word of God. He's challenged by von der Ecken the uh, orator of, of Trier, with words to the effect of just get rid of your wretched conscience, man! Which is, of course, not the way to respond to anyone who says what Luther says. We must seek God's, God's mind in his word. And may God help us in the study of his word and in the study of these books that lead us into that holy and precious word of God. Well, thank you for watching and may God bless you and keep you and help you and help us all as we seek to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints.